Instead of wasting my time on this imbecile even further, I decided to rewatch the Venom movies again. Starting with the first Venom movie, so if you guys saw my community post, I said I rewatched both Venom movies and that I wasn't really satisfied with how I watched them and felt like I need to rewatch them again. So this is my fifth viewing of the first movie and I believe my fourth viewing of Let There Be Carnage. So I'm not sure if I'm going to review both movies in one go or have this full video be a re-review of the first movie and the next video a re-review for Let There Be Carnage. But today, as of right now in the video, I'm re-reviewing re the first Venom movie to see if it holds up. It's funny how on my community post I said, yeah, this film doesn't hold up very well. But then I rewatched it again and I actually enjoyed it a lot more. And some of the problems I mentioned in the community post were kind of resolved for rewatching this for a fifth time. So, yeah, but like, I'm still going to discuss the movie either way because I don't know. It's like my first time watching it since, well, eh. The beginning of my videos are like never scripted, so that's why I always screw up here and there. And I actually wrote shit down for this review, so this review is more of like a, hey, here's me reviewing a comic book movie again, or a comic book project, or whatever. Here's more of an important video of mine, basically. So let's take a look back at the first Venom movie. So the film starts off with a similar origin story to how Venom gets to Earth, like in the comics, with um, John Jameson securing the symbiotes with his space partner. But something happens when the symbiotes break free and takes control of John Jameson being Riot, pretty much. Except in the comic, it's just Venom who is in space and then gets um, secured. But in this movie, John Jameson and his uh, partner, who is not named and just get, is killed off randomly. But anyway, they, get, they secure four symbiotes, Venom, Riot... A blue symbiote and a yellow symbiote who I assume is Scream, but probably not because I have a feeling she's going to be in The Last Dance, so it's probably just a symbiote with the same color as her. But anyway, Colton needs these symbiotes because he believes that they're the key for people to live out of, live outer space and, you know, no need spacesuits or whatever. That's basically his motivation to why he needs these symbiotes. It's kind of hard to explain why he, you know, thinks these are the key and how he figured out about the symbiotes. But it is told by Dr. Skirth when Eddie Brock and her go into this facility or sneak into the facility. So, because Dr. Skirth is now against of what Colton Drake is doing. I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but like, I feel like I needed to for something like this. But anyway, John Jameson gets recovered. Well, not really. Riot takes over his body, takes over the, um, ambulance worker. I can't believe I can't find the name for her. Fuck. But anyway, he, t Riot takes another form. The ambulance truck crashes and pretty much John Jameson and the ambulance driver is also dead. And possibly the host that Riot is using. So it's just Riot taking over her body. I don't know. It's actually not really explained ha what happens. We're just led to believe any host Riot took before Colton was dead the moment he went in their body. So after the opening, we cut to San Francisco, which this movie's universe takes place in. Not in New York, because I'm sure with continuity, if because non comic fans, like general audiences, would probably be confused if this is in continuity with the MCU or not. But heck, maybe even comic book fans would be confused because, you know, this movie was not going to have Spider-Man in it. And a Finny War was happening in the MCU, so, you know, with the blip and stuff, that shit would be weird. Or the snap, because the blip is a stupid name. Though, some people still theorize Andrew Garfield is the Spider-Man of this universe, but, like, I don't know, I kind of want him to be because I don't want his universe to be milked. Just, like, make Tasm 3 and let, let his story be concluded, not, like, expand his universe, because Sony's pretty much still doing what they were planning to do. And that was Milk, the Tasm universe. But anyway, he has his girlfriend, Anne, played by Heath Ledger's girlfriend, God rest his soul. She works with Colton Drake and Eddie work at the Daily Globe. Eddie knows that Colton Drake is like a scumbag and is just not a great person. He believes all these allegations against him. 
and in an interview he's doing with um, Colton Drake, Eddie gets a little skeptical and interrogates him with all these allegations and rumors. And of course, this gets him to lose his job and his girlfriend because his girlfriend was working with Colton Drake. And, you know, everyone was telling him, even his boss and his girlfriend, to not get ahead of yourself and just do the job correctly and just answer the questions you were given. And he didn't listen and he lost his job and his girlfriend. And they were going to get married, so they got a pre-divorce. Also, I forgot to mention, before he did the interview, he went through Anne's passwords after their date night because... Actually, I don't know why. I guess because he needed more info on Colton and allegations and stuff. I mean, if that's the case, then, like, why didn't you use that to show your boss? I guess, apparently, it wasn't enough because... They were still rumors or whatever. I don't fucking know. I guess there were some evidence, but not enough to where the allegations are true. We cut back to Riot, still in a different country and in the paramedic's body still. And when riot has been exposed by eating an eel and using his powers to slight, slit um, a guy's throat, a bunch of people come to stop him, shoots out spikes from his back, and takes... Uh, well, pretty much goes into another host's body, this time an old woman. And then we cut to six months later. I have a lot of problems with the six-month gap. Like, I get you need to separate the relationship between Anne and Eddie, like, in order for her to fully move on and be with Dan, who was her new husband. Well, not husband yet until the second movie. I get that, but, like, you're telling me Riot, like, during those six months, Riot did not go into another body like because literally he was in the paramedic for only a few hours or god knows how long like not that not even a day just a few hours but he was in this old lady's body for six months what was riot doing for those said six months like how long did it take for him to come to san francisco what was he doing during those six months like was he just chilling back and relaxing? Was he getting used to how the world works? It makes no sense. And once he's in the airport, he his next host decides to be a little girl. It's like now, like after six months, now you decide like, eh, I don't want to be in the ho I don't want to be in the body of an old lady anymore. I know this sounds like a nitpick, but like sometimes you kind of just have to ask yourself. Yeah, sometimes gaps in movies don't work because there's a lot that needs to be explained. And another thing I'm going to explain is the amount of tests they have once Drake got Drake got um, the symbiotes, the Venom and the other two. He mainly did test on the other two, mainly the blue one, since that's the most screen time we see of that symbiote. We hardly get screen time of the yellow symbiote, except for like, oh, it's in the container and then it's dead. But during those six months, they only did 36 tests on animals, mainly a rabbit or a bunny pretty much typical subject animals you use. I find it crazy how during those six months, it was only 36 tests. Like you think they'd be on tests 100,000 or 600 or whatever. Like that seems pretty short for like six months. Like 36 tests would only take like maybe a few weeks or close to a month. Like it wouldn't be that long of a gap. Like again, I'm not a scientist or whatever, but like I'm pretty sure 36 tests would be less than six months. So Drake decides to do the first human test with a symbiote. And obviously the symbiotes need humans to survive. They need a host to survive pretty much. But like, you know, this has been retconned countless times. Heck, now in the comics, I'm pretty sure they don't even need a host to survive. They can survive on their own. And the six-month gap made me question, how are they able to survive this long without a host for six months? Like, how long... So I had to do some research to remember, like, how long can a symbiote last without a host? And it just said indefinitely, because of the whole null bullshit. It, yeah, it's very confusing with the retcons and how the symbiote works, because I always believe that only on their planet they can survive without a host, but anywhere else, they will be dead without a host. Like, I thought that's why they need hosts to survive on planet Earth. But apparently they can just survive on their own now, thanks to the whole Null arc, which, again, I haven't read. 
I haven't paid attention to Marvel Comics recently besides the current run on Ultimate Spider-Man. Well, mainly I just don't read modern comics anymore unless they're really interesting, like the absolute DC universe currently. But let's just say originally for this universe, and I'm sure for its original adaption or a retcon before, it can be okay to survive without a host, that they need a, a certain host. Like, they need to kind of relate with that host in order to survive or the human to survive. Well, in order for the host to survive. So they have many failed test subjects, pretty much. Like, random homeless people on the street, including Mary, who is a homeless friend of Eddie's. They capture her off-screen, and I'm not sure how, because she doesn't seem like... She, well, we only have one moment with her, really, so... Who knows, maybe they were... Maybe they tricked her and offering her free food and stuff. But anyway, the first test gives Dr. Skirt the benefit of the... Well, not the benefit of the doubt. But this gets her kind of not on Drake's side anymore and believes that, you know, these allegations are true, which she knew the whole time. It's just they had to cover it all up. So she decides to go to Eddie about it, who she somehow found in Mrs. Chen's store. Yeah, I'm just realizing a lot of people somehow just know where Eddie is in this film. At first, Eddie declines because, you know, he tried exposing Colton Drake at first, but he lost his job and his woman. And when he declines at first, says no, he then goes to see Anne's apartment or her house and sees that she has moved on and is with another man, Dan, who's a doctor. And, you know, this upsets Brock and this catches him to change his mind. So I realized this the first time I was watching this, not when I oh, was watching it for my first review. I'm talking about when I, I said, oh, it didn't hold up well, but then I had to rewatch it again because I wasn't sure. So when um, Dr. Skirth was bringing Eddie into the facility undercover, pretty much she's ex given a better reason than I could to why Dr. Colt, or not Dr. Colton, Drake Colton is doing this. And like I said earlier, it's mainly because he wants, he thinks symbiotes are the key to having humans live outer space for the future of generations or mankind evolving or whatever. I think, th I think she explains to Eddie how Dr. Colvin figured this out, but we, the audience, are never shown it. You know the thing, show, don't tell? It, it, they are pulling that. It's like, you kind of need to show us how he figured this out or knew about symbiotes to begin with. All we have is, oh, he probably... There were probably, there's probably their first cue to it or whatever. I mean, that's, I guess, what we're led to believe. So pretty much, I guess, is when John Jameson was securing the symbiote, this was their first discovery of it. Because that's the only way for it to make sense. If that's the case, then I think the opening should have been, have been a bit more extended. But anyway, the one thing I was realizing is when they're going inside the building... I'm, like, thinking, aren't there security cameras? Like, I know you have security guards, but, like, should there still be security cameras at least? Because, you know, eventually she gets caught. They find out she brought Eddie to the facility, and one of the symbiotes, well, Drake uses one of the blue, the, well, the blue symbiote to consume her because he figured she wouldn't be a suitable host. I just find it silly how he asks her, like, who... Who did he, who did she brought here? Who did she bring here? And who has the symbiote? And she says Eddie Brock. But I'm just thinking, can't you just go through the security cameras to identify who is she with? Like, you guys are, like, are owning a company about, oh, like, this is going to be the future of mankind kind of thing. And you don't have security cameras? Like, come on. But anyway, she gets caught because... Because she signed herself in when the place was closed. And two guards found it suspicious. That's kind of why she gets caught and then later dies. Which, by the way, happens later in the film before Eddie gets the symbiote. So once again, I'm going a bit ahead of myself. But, like, at some points, I kind of have to. And I'm sure if you were doing this, you would feel the same way. Especially because this movie's been out for, like, what, five years now? If you're a diehard Spider-Man fan, then why would you not see this movie? I would understand why you wouldn't see Madame Webb, because I haven't. So Eddie is through this facility of what Dr. Colton is, or Colton Drake is doing, and he has these homeless people and is using them as subjects for the symbiote. 
one of the patients screams when they see Eddie, and he realizes that it's Maria. So he tries to break her out. Loud noises happen, because, you know, security shit. And she gets all crazy and attacks him. But really, it's just a symbiote going inside Eddie, and Maria dies. So pretty much in this universe, the symbiote... Or probably, I'm sure this was how it was currently in the comics, because, you know, like I said, the symbiote got retconned so many times and is still being retconned. Um, but by the way, they did a good job at having Eddie get the symbiote without Peter having it first or ha not having Spider-Man. They somehow did a good job because, you know, if they were going to make a Spider-Man-like movie without Spider-Man, they had to make it work somehow, and they surprisingly did a pretty good job for it. Eddie gets the suit, he escapes... Hides in the really tall tree that they surprisingly don't look up at. But then again, he's really, really high. But the way when they get to the cut, the, the camera shot where, you know, he's looking down, it's kind of like, okay, like with that, you'll be able to spot him. But like, whatever. So anyway, he finds where Ann and Dan are and shows them what uh, Colton is planning. But um, they're more distracted about how crazy he looks and like he looks like he did drugs. And I think... I think Ann asked him if he was drunk or not. And, you know, he goes a bit... Everyone in the dining... Well, not dining room. Um, nice rest... The restaurant are looking at him like he's crazy. And I'm surprised no one took out their phone and started filming him. But then again, I'm sure they're more mature than that. And it was more of a reacting in the moment. Which, you know, I probably would have done the same. I would be too distracted to look at him. Like, I don't know if I'd be ready to take out my phone. If he, he was acting all that crazy. So Dan says he'll help him, and they do some tests on him, and they, he comes to the conclusion that Eddie may have a parasite. So anyway, we, we now go back to the scene I was mentioning before with Dr. Skirth. She then tells Colton that Eddie was with her, because Colton was telling her that you can trust me and stuff. And when he finds out it was Eddie, he was like, you were the best, and has the symbiote killer. So, I get now that he knows that was Eddie, but the one thing I don't get is, how did he find Eddie's apartment? Like, that's never explained. It's just, oh, they found his apartment because the plot needs them to find it. Same thing happens later in the film when he's at the, the hospital, where he goes back again and splits up with the symbiote, Venom, pretty much. And he gets kidnapped again. Well, not kidnapped. Well, he didn't get kidnapped the first time. He gets kidnapped by um, Colton's goon, or men. And it's kind of like, how did they know he was there? And I know it's sort of similar, but I'm also talking about with the SWAT team. As cool as the fight team was, how did they know what was going on there? I'm guessing with the, when Venom was climbing on top of the building. That's my explanation. So that has sort of a reasoning. But for the other stuff, it's like, how did they figure that out? Like, how did they know he was there? But anyway, after all that... We finally see Venom in the film. Eddie Brock is now Venom. And it only took... Um, close to the end of the second act... Or middle of the second act... Like... Venom's not in the film for like majority of it. Which again... I understand it's an origin story... And you have to expand and introduce these characters... Or these versions of these characters. And I have to say... It was satisfying though... To see Venom... For the first time in this film... And I say the CGI holds up pretty well. Like, that's the one thing I think Sony does better than Marvel or Disney. Is that they have better CGI in their movies. Like, look at this, and then look at the modern MCU CGI. Like, it looks unfinished and bad. And I say, I think Venom's design... I know it's similar to how it is in Let There Be Carnage, but... I don't know, there's something about Venom's CGI in Let There Be Carnage that I just don't like. It just looks bad for some reason, in my opinion. While here, it looks slightly better. Like, I like how more... I like how wet he looks in this, despite how weird that sounds. I don't know. It just looks... I don't know. He looks more dry to me and like, Let There Be Carnage. Also, Venom's voice is way better in this film than in, in Let There Be Carnage and Last Dance. Like, here he sounds more menacing. In fact, I think Venom is overall better written in this film. He sounds more menacing and like a threat. Where in the next film, they kind of make him a bit more goofy. Again, the PS1 Spider-Man games, they did that. But, you know, only he, he can get away with that. I just realized that sounded hypocritical of me. It's like, oh, you're okay with PS1 Spider-Man Venom being a uh, goofball, but not how he is in Let There Be Carnage? I feel like they just do a bit too much in the 
modern Venom movies when he's being silly. Where in the PS1 game, it felt appropriate because, like, you know, he's being very serious at first, but um, later when he's teaming up with Spidey, he starts to, you know, get his anti-hero side out. Which is why no one complains about, oh, they're making, or Sony's making all of their, his villains anti-heroes. No one complains about it with Venom because Venom is an anti-hero. They're more complaining about it with Morbius and Kraven the Hunter. But anyway, after he's introduced to Venom, he um goes tries to go on the run, go in hiding. Annie tries to call him because she hears what happened with everything. Dead bodies everywhere, heads gone. <laughs> She's calling Eddie to ask what happened, and she overhears that Eddie's at um, his old job, the Daily Globe, and when his old friend tries, well, when he tries to get in, his old friend won't let him. So then Venom decides to go up on the building, and then he hears that, well, Eddie hears that Venom is playing on pretty much taking over the world. Well, not his idea, more of Riot's idea, but that was pretty much their plan the whole time. They're pretty much going to pull a web of shadows. Take the hose of some people and kill the rest. So they're inside the office. Eddie t puts his phone on his boss's desk with all the evidence to expose Colton Drake. And Venom tells him to jump, but Eddie's afraid of heights and is a pussy. Venom's words, not mine. Then the SWAT come in and we have a nice battle between Venom fighting the SWAT team, which is probably one of the best fight teams of the movie. I would say the fight scenes for a PG-13 Venom film, they're pretty good. It's just, I kind of wish they were rated R, especially when Vimes, Venom's biting the heads off the victims or the enemies. You kind of wish it was rated R. But I will excuse this movie for being PG-13 since it's the first attempt and Carnage is not the villain. Whereas in the second film, that should have been rated R because it's Carnage and the title's called Let There Be Carnage and there's barely any Carnage in that film. I'm talking about massacring, not like the Carnage character. But after Venom clears out the SWAT team, Anne comes in and is terrified. Um, she tells him to go to the hospital with her, and Dan tests him again. And when Venom tries to attack Dan because Anne and Dan believe that Venom is using Eddie, um, Eddie and Venom split up. Eddie gets rid of the symbiote. And then somehow Colton's crew finds Eddie and tranquilizes him and Venom managed to escape from the cell he was locked in because you know through a ventilation obviously and takes the host of a dog which I'm sure that dog was more of a suitable host than Maria or any other host that Riot had before Colton which somehow the little girl who was Riot's current host got into the facility I'm guessing Riot used his powers to kill whatever guards were in his way or got in easily but anyway, Anne sees that Eddie is gone and that Venom escaped. And she sees that the uh, poodle, not poodle, on um, the puppy has the symbiote inside of him. Or she, I'm not sure if the dog was a boy or girl. But anyway, the next time we see Anne, we see her as she Venom as Eddie's about to be executed. And they have a nice little kiss, Venom's idea, according to her. And, you know, we see her as she Venom and, you know, she kind of bad though. So now we get into the final battle. So Riot is planning to go back to his planet with, along with um, Colton Drake now being his host to bring in more symbiotes and create a symbiote invasion. But um, Venom decides to change his mind and realize that he likes it here. And yeah, pretty much Eddie is what made him change his mind. Yet, there, yet any scene before, there's really no scene before where Venom's like, He's hesitated or anything because he seems to just agree with Riot at first. But I'm guessing his dynamic with Eddie after they split up for a few minutes, he realized, I guess, um, I like Eddie and I like it here. I like these people. So then, yeah, and then he fights Riot. And yeah, the final battle was good. The CGI is gorgeous for both symbiotes and both Venom and Riot. Even if the third act feels a bit anticlimactic slash rushed, in fact, this is a very quick movie. I also liked how, you know, Venom's like saying, oh, Anne, you can't help us. But in the end, she manages to help them by creating a sound wave so Riot would be defeated, but also Venom technically got defeated. So then um, Colton tries fighting Eddie. And I like how when Colton's about to give his evil speech, when he realizes Riot is still close to him, 
He kicks him in the face. It seems like he falls to his death, but uh, he bonded with Riot and stabs Eddie, presumably killing him. But then Venom reunites with Eddie, and Eddie is healed. And yeah, Riot's already in the rocket ship, and Venom uses um, the spike Riot left behind and creates a hole leaking gasoline, I guess, or oil or whatever. I think gasoline, pretty much. And the rocket goes to flames, killing Riot and Colton. And Venom, at first, is presumed to be dead, but pieces of him survived Eddie. Because the screen cuts to black, and he has a nice moment with Anne saying goodbye to her for now. And we find out that Eddie's still... Not Eddie, um, Venom's still alive. And we get a nice cameo from Stan Lee. God rest his soul. I missed him so much. Marvel has not been the same without Stan Lee. And it sucks when you realize this movie came out a month before he died. That makes it even sadder. And of course, we get an after cred scene teasing Carnage, starring Woody Harrison playing Cletus Cassidy. Great casting choice, but unfortunately, the after credit was only foreshadowing a sequel that was a letdown. And there's another after credit showing a sneak peek of Into the Spider-Verse, which came out two months later, and is a better movie. And that was my re-review of Venom 2018, or just Venom. And so now that I've watched this film five times, yeah, I saw it once in the theater. I saw it again when it was on digital. I saw it a third time to review it. I saw it a fourth time, which was um, two days after I just finished watching it to get ready for Last Dance. But then I wasn't sure if I was satisfied with my opinion on it or not. So then I rewatched it again today. And here we are. So for my inclusion, I'm going to give Venom a 5 out of 10. So my rating pretty much hasn't changed for this movie. Well, I'm talking about on my community posts. Because originally, my original review, I gave it a 7. And I was thinking, oh, maybe going back to a 7. And I was thinking maybe a 6. But I think you're going to get a 5 out of 10 at best. So yeah, Venom's a 5 out of 10. And to be honest, I think this film had a lot more potential and... Should have had a lot more moments with Eddie and Venom. Because, I don't know, I feel like when it gets to the third act, it feels anticlimactic to me. But still an enjoyable comic book flick. And if you're a diehard Venom fan like me, then you'll enjoy the movie. So yeah, 5 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you guys next time when I re-review Let There Be Carnage. So it turns out this is not me reviewing both movies in one go. Because this video is long enough already. And I don't want to make this video an hour.